Hello, I'm Allison Johnson. For over a decade, I've been writing books and making documentaries on the subject of multiple chemical sensitivity. In the 14 years that have passed since I produced and directed my first documentary titled Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, How Chemical Exposures May Be Affecting Your Health, more and more people have succumbed to this condition. Hardly a day goes by that I do not hear from someone who is close to despair as they see their former life slipping away from them as they struggle with a condition that has been largely ignored by the medical profession. For decades, there was great resistance to the idea that smoking could be a health hazard. Today, there is a similar resistance to the concept that exposure to the ever-increasing number of toxic chemicals in our daily lives could cause health problems. I hadn't really focused that much on, uh, on how dangerous the paints were, you know. We knew when we read the back end of a paint can that, you know, it said it'll cause this and cause that and cause this and cause that, and we used to laugh and say, why don't they just say it'll kill you? People just don't understand how sensitive you can be and how sick you can become from, you know, household cleaning products or their perfume or their aftershave or, or little things like that. Mothballs. <laughs> a, a horrible. <laughs> you know, you walk by a little old lady that's had her stuff stored in mothballs for the, you know, for the summer. And, you know, and it's, it's nauseating and it's those simple everyday things of life that uh, that can make you very ill. When I was painting, uh, the crew and I would joke about the fact that we were killing brain cells. Humans have evolved over millions of years in an environment of relatively clean air, earth, and water. Since World War II, however, tens of thousands of new chemicals have entered the marketplace, and the safety of most of them has not been verified by any government agency. According to a General Accounting Office document from 1994, over 70,000 chemicals are in use in the United States. Although these chemicals are an important part of our economy, they are often toxic and can have adverse effects on human health. I started um, in the tree business in Connecticut in 1980. Uh, eventually, you know, built up to lots of employees, lots of trucks. In a 90-day period in the spring, we would spray over 100,000 gallons of pesticide. And when I finally realized that I was becoming sensitive, the first thing that I noticed was I was having trouble with foods and um, didn't make the connection that I was having trouble with the pesticides themselves until um, I noticed I would get sick being around the trucks that had the pesticides in them, which didn't seem to make much sense to me, but I started avoiding being near the trucks full of pesticides. And uh, one morning while spraying a hospital, uh, broke out in a rash pretty much from head to foot. Even though I wasn't actually spraying the chemicals myself, I was just nearby supervising. Um, and I, I got real sick came down with, you know, what I thought was the flu at the time, and basically just never recovered. I still have to be really careful because all I need is a slight exposure, and for some reason, petroleum will really set me off, uh, you know, different kinds of household chemicals. Different things will just set me right back. One of the things that happened after I got sick, which, um, was the, the business with the fatigue. I couldn't stay awake for more than three or four hours at a time. And that, that lasted for easily over six months. I can remember getting up in the morning, sending the guys out to work, coming home at 10, 10.30 in the morning and falling asleep and, and staying asleep till the middle of the afternoon. Waking up when they would come back in, you know, put the trucks away and stuff and go back to sleep, you know, right after dinner, 6.30, I mean, you know, sleep for 12 hours and get up and still be exhausted. Like there was no amount of sleep that would, would cover it. There's a significant percentage of people in our population uh, who have a hyperreactivity to common environmental chemicals, uh, things like cigarette smoke and paint fumes and solvents and cleaning products, ammonia, 
various irritating chemicals and um, the more extreme of these individuals have what we call multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome and these are individuals who are so sensitive to these everyday chemicals uh, they have problems involving multiple organ systems and in the more extreme cases are actually disabled by their inability to function in ordinary society where um, every day of our lives we're, we're exposed to a host of, of these environmental chemicals. A few years ago, a taxi cab driver from Las Vegas emailed me to say, I was making good money driving a taxi, but I had to resign because the other driver would spray it with air freshener. Eventually, the cab made me so sick I had to quit. In fact, the city of New York has banned the use of air fresheners in all its city cabs. This taxi cab driver from Las Vegas is just one of millions of Americans who are trying desperately to hold on to jobs that are damaging their health and making them sicker with each day that passes. Christine Oliver at Harvard Medical School is the Director of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. Multiple chemical sensitivity, or MCS, is a multi-system disease that is characterized by symptoms associated with exposure to low levels of chemical vapors. These levels of exposure are commonly found in the ambient environment. Systems that are affected by MCS include the respiratory system, the neurologic system, the gastrointestinal system, the skin in some cases. For those with less severe illness and disease, symptoms may include cough, a shortness of breath, a headache, in association with exposure to chemicals on an elevator or when they open a magazine and have a scented uh, insert in the magazine. For those who are more severely affected, however, symptoms can be truly disabling. They interfere with a person's ability to engage in gainful employment. They interfere with a person's ability to use public transportation. They interfere with a person's ability to live in a multifamily housing unit. They interfere with family life. They are isolating in short, so that individuals with MCS who are severely affected often feel very isolated. I see this in patients that I see at the MGH. One of the reasons for their isolation is that physicians do not get this disease. They don't understand this disease. Medical students are not taught about multiple chemical sensitivity. Physicians in training know very little about multiple chemical sensitivity or MCS. Some MCS patients have relatively mild cases. I myself was fortunate to be able to reduce the chemical exposures in my life sufficiently that I could return to normal activities. For many people with MCS, however, the condition can be quite debilitating, even life-threatening in some cases. Unfortunately, MCS can make it almost impossible for people to maintain their social life, to keep working, or even to find a safe place to live. My name is Benny Howard. I'm the acting director of the Office of Disability Policy at the U.S. Department of Housing and urban development in Washington, D.C. Federal laws, specifically the Fair Housing Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and the Americans with Disability Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. HUD considers multiple chemical sensitivity to be a disability under these laws. I'm a high school history teacher from Washington State and I became very ill uh, working in my classroom. Uh, mold was discovered in my classroom and I became very sensitive to mold and later developed multiple chemical sensitivity. Molds have become a very big problem. Well they've, they've always been a big problem but the awareness of the problems of molds have really increased recently. Uh, molds can cause problems in two ways. 
One is people can have immunological reactions to the proteins on the mold spores. They can be allergic to them or get hypersensitivity pneumonitis or other problems associated with the proteins on the mold spores. But there's another problem with molds. Um, when you have high concentrations of molds, such as in a damp, moldy basement or whatever, the molds actually produce what are called mycotoxins. And these are low molecular weight chemicals that get in the air and they can be very irritating to the respiratory system, particularly in people who have asthma, chronic sinusitis, or rhinitis, or other chronic respiratory conditions. As a result of this, my workplace uh, environment it be became very difficult. I uh, became sensitive to some of the products we're using in the classroom, magic markers, whiteboard markers, uh, the shampoos they were using to clean the carpet, and some of the cleaners that they were using. I initially discovered this by losing my voice. I became very hoarse, and as a uh, coach and as a teacher, you can understand how that became very difficult to do my job. Ironically, I was an All-American uh, wrestler in college, and um, everybody was very surprised when I became very ill uh, and, ha and had many different symptoms, uh, headaches. I gained a considerable amount of weight. I had a lot of fatigue and basically was very lethargic, didn't have a lot of energy as a result of uh, these acquired uh, sensitivity. My workplace environment did improve a little bit uh, once the school decided to move me into another classroom that was not infected with mold. Uh, it was very challenging and, and very difficult to do my job. The um, students, I had to ask not to wear perfume, which was awkward for some of these younger kids that really didn't have an understanding or uh, a sensitivity to the possibility that people react to various chemicals. People with multiple chemical sensitivity serve as the canaries in the mine that alert all of us to the danger of exposure to toxic chemicals in our daily lives. Efforts to accommodate these people may well help improve the health of all of us and help reduce rapidly escalating health costs that our society faces. I worked in a state land use planning agency in San Francisco, California for 10 years. Then I came to work on a Monday morning and they had glued down new carpeting over the weekend and I immediately started having very severe reactions to the carpet. I, I couldn't think straight, I couldn't talk straight, I couldn't uh, walk straight, I couldn't compose a simple letter, um, I had uh, pain in my chest, I had swollen lymph nodes, I had burning in my lungs. The reactions, the physical reactions just continued to build and increase. I, uh, I tried to come to work and on the weekends I would sleep all weekend so I could come to work the following Monday. Um, I could barely even climb the stairs to my office. I had to pull myself up by the handrail. I was so severely fatigued. I had no idea what it meant to, to um, have any problems with anything. Uh, very healthy. I hiked in the Himalayas and uh, I then became a person that could barely get out of bed. I started reacting to um, copier fumes in the office to the to the smell of the uh, copy paper, um, to people's shampoo, to their laundry products, uh, to the files that I had to use. They smelled moldy and um, we had a new secretary who wore a lot of perfume and I could barely even walk by her without feeling like I was going to pass out. Many people with MCS are so sensitive to fragrances that they virtually become prisoners in their own home, unable to attend church, work, classes, or social gatherings because of the perfume, aftershave, shampoos, detergent, and fabric softeners used by others. To make matters worse, some of those who insist that MCS is just a psychologically based illness state that these people are suffering from agoraphobia or fear of crowds. That's as cruel as saying to a paraplegic in a wheelchair, too bad you don't like to walk. I have a tendency toward migraines and what can happen is that I'll go into one of these situations with carpeting or paint or whatever. I will get what I call an allergic headache and if I'd stay in that situation too long, I end up with this horrible migraine. And then it lasts 
two or three days and I'm nauseated and I'm kind of incapacitated for a long period of time, which is really very bad because I'm a very busy person. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm very active in my church. Um, I teach and I just don't have time for that. So basically the way I manage these things is by avoidance because that keeps me healthy enough so that I can, I can work every day. Um, you need to know what you need to get away from and how fast you need to get away from it in order to not become ill. One reason that the medical profession has found it difficult to understand multiple chemical sensitivity, or MCS, is the patients with MCS can have a wide variety of symptoms as the result of chemical exposures, with different patients having different symptoms. A given patient, however, will usually have the same symptom in response to a given exposure, perhaps getting a headache after exposure to paint or perfume, or developing arthritic pains after exposure to natural gas or pesticide. A SPECT scan is a scan where the patient is given a radioactive material. The radioactivity travels to the brain. The computer picks it up and wherever the activity is, uh, that implies in a SPECT scan that blood flow is a given value. So then you get a color picture and the color picture tells you whether your blood flow is higher than normal, normal or less than normal. And if you do the SPECT scan that way, in a new way, we can now show where the abnormality is in such a way that everybody can understand it. And these are scans which we call three-dimensional SPECT scans. And the one I brought shows various parts of the brain, one from the left, one a view from the left, view from the right, front and back. And if you look, then you find that the blue areas are the impaired areas. So on that particular scan, we have compared my patient, who happened to be disabled from chemical exposure, with a control group. And in this particular patient, we find that there are blue areas uh, on the SPECT scan which show impairment. And that impairment correlates with what the patient complains of, memory problems and other problems. So that's the SPECT scan. And anyway, I was raised down here in Cajun country, in, uh down here we've got the oil field and uh, offshore work and that kind of thing. It's our main industry down here is oil. And when I was 18, uh, I went to work offshore. Uh, we used to go out there. I remember one time we went out there and we had an eight-legged platform and, we, and a crew of six men. We sandblasted and painted that whole thing from one end to the other. Anyway, I was always breathing MEK and uh, you know, which was a cleaning solvent that we used regularly every day. It was an everyday thing. Yes, it was around Christmas of 1988, and uh, I landed a job with some people that wanted somebody that uh, that didn't want to go offshore. Everybody was screaming to go offshore, going to make more money, and I had had my fill of offshore. I wanted to work on land, and but then I'd go drive trucks and everything. But I was getting to where I was driving trucks more than paint. When I was getting away from this sandblasting and painting, gradually getting away from it like that, I was beginning to notice that every time I did spray paint, and I sprayed paint, uh, in particularly urethane paints that contained isocyanate, that I had to have a respirator on and just to mix it. It got to where uh, I couldn't tolerate the MEK and I was having this sort of like a pinching sensation in my chest. You know, every time I got around this MEK or that urethane paint, this guy came over and wanted this boat painting. I'd go in and out and in and out of this uh, welding shop that didn't have any kind of ventilation or anything like that. And I couldn't open up the doors because there was sand everywhere and the wind would blow the sand in on the pretty boat. So the man wanted his boat done to perfection. And so, um, and going in and out and in and out and putting my respirator on and off and on and off and painting outside and painting inside and all of that. It was just, it, it, my, I think my body just reached a level where uh, 
you know, that was it. I just like I crossed, you know, some sort of a line or something. The next morning, Tony woke up feeling as if he had a chest cold, and a few days later, he was hospitalized. When he returned home, his health continued to deteriorate. You know, by this time, my ankles uh, began to feel, it felt as though I was walking around on sprung ankles, and the bottoms of my feet were like on fire. I couldn't walk from the sofa to the bathroom. I was in a bind. I'm a single parent. Uh, I had to sit in a chair, you know, to wash dishes and stuff. I mean, I just, I, I, I literally, I, I just couldn't hardly do anything, you know. Finally, you know, I was getting hungry. It was about three weeks, um, running out of money and all that. So uh, I went to the doctor and I asked him, I said, man, I said, are you going to let me go back to work or whatever? And he was totally against it. By the second day that I was there, they, uh, they had me loading the truck to go to Texas, the same diesel-driven uh, truck. When I came back home that night on the interstate, man, I thought I was gonna die. And uh, the next day I went into work to tell them that, you know, I, I just can't do this, man. And uh, about that time, this, this, uh, the doctor, that pulmonary function specialist had called me with the results of the spec scan. He said, uh, you got slight brain damage, from that point on, Tony was never able to work again, and he remains highly sensitive to a wide range of chemicals. What we do know is that in the, in the metabolic scans that are done in the brain function of patients, we very clearly see that there is a change and a difference in the brain function of chemically sensitive patients. That it is not psychological, that it is, looks entirely different. The metabolism of their brain looks entirely different from what is seen in, say, schizophrenia or depression or other psychiatric conditions. The metabolism in the brain function of chemically sensitive patients is most closely uh, alike to uh, that which is seen in patients who have been toxically exposed to things, to chemicals. Often there is a toxicity that goes on in their brain metabolism that correlates with what the patients report as far as some of these symptoms of anxiety or depression or they can't think, they can't remember, they lose their sense of direction. Those kinds of symptoms have been associated with neurotoxicity for many, many years. Four cataclysmic events have rocked the United States in the last two decades. The 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill, the 1991 Gulf War, the destruction of the World Trade Center in 2001, and Hurricane Katrina in 2005. At first glance, these events might seem to have little in common, but all have left in their wake large numbers of people who are now chronically ill after exposure to large amounts of toxic chemicals. In my 2008 book, Amputated Lives, Coping with Chemical Sensitivity, I write about the devastating effects of these major toxic exposures. Dr. Lee Steele, an epidemiologist, uh, published a study in the American Journal of Epidemiology in November of 2000, which documented that over 200,000 of people who served in the first Gulf War are now chronically ill. That's over one-third of those who served. In the mid-1990s, I commanded Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Uh, I continued to work on looking for causes for the illnesses suffered by many Gulf War veterans, illnesses that clearly were more than stress related. Uh, I looked at vaccines, I looked at exposure to smokes, to other toxic chemicals, petrochemicals and so forth, all that were part of that battlefield experience. Uh, and, and I came to the conclusion uh, that at least one of the explanations was multiple chemical sensitivity, something where a variety of toxic elements even at low levels by themselves in combination may in susceptible individuals uh, be causing these illnesses. And, and I believe so much more work needs to be done in that, but it is clearly one of the explanations. Since I've been back from the Gulf War, uh, you know, I also noticed that uh, a lot of things bother me that never bothered me before. Uh, different perfume, different cologne, uh, gas, uh, different smell of even smoke or cigarettes, you know, I just automatically get sick, you know. And sometimes it takes me 
days or weeks to recover. One day I was on the elevator and someone got on there with some loud perfume. And then all of a sudden uh, it hit me and I got lightheaded. Roy's blood pressure shot up so high that the emergency room staff thought he was having a heart attack. He ended up spending four days in the hospital. You know, the chemical sensitivity is just becoming unreal. And, and you notice it now. It's before when you used to pump gas, you stand there and smell the fumes. You know, great, you know, this is, you know, this stuff don't bother me. Now it's, you know, you got to try to hide and pump at the same time. During the Gulf War, Sherry McGahee served in the 1st Infantry as an intelligence analyst. been gradually getting worse off and uh, I don't know really what's going on with me. I am fighting to uh, uh, be a ben men meaningful person in the community. One of the things about investigating patients who have Gulf War illness, Gulf War syndrome, is that there are now some very high-tech, very objective measurements that can be used that are really very different from the subjective things that they say, well, I have this and this and this and this wrong with me. We can now do imaging of the brain metabolism and there are two different types of high-tech imaging uh, technology, one called SPECT and the other one called MRI spectroscopy, which are really very different, but they both confirm beyond any doubt that the metabolism in the brains of the patients who are reporting the Gulf War illness symptoms is distinctly abnormal. And it's abnormal in a way that indicates that there's a toxicity and a damage that has occurred in the brains of these, of these veterans. I have a mind <laughs> and it's hard to talk. I forget things when uh, I'm talking to people. Uh, uh, I don't remember everything and then it will come to me later on. But um, I have um, memory problems since the Gulf War. Some of the more exciting work that's appearing recently about the abnormalities that appear in the brain function of Gulf War syndrome patients has been done by a team of researchers headed up by Dr. Robert Haley based at the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center in Dallas. And what they have done is looked at the metabolism in the brains of the Gulf War veterans, showing clearly that there is a neurotoxicity, that there is brain damage in these people when compared to controls. I lost teeth there uh, uh, what you say um, eating uh, the insides out of the teeth I'm getting 100% disability from BA. I was only getting 60% from the Army. And uh, that take me over a year to get that. One of the reasons why it took Sherry McGahee so long to obtain 100% disability was that Army doctors had misdiagnosed her case as, quote, a fairly chronic depressive disorder associated with multiple physical complaints and a chronic pattern of social maladjustment, end quote. The Army psychiatric reports on Sherry McGahee contained these phrases. As observed by others working in this soldier's case, the patient tends to present with multiple somatic complaints that are either unfounded, given medical examination, or are significantly in excess of what might be expected given any positive results from medical examination. 
Patients with this type of response style tend to overreport their symptoms in an attempt to elicit assistance. She does have a history of satisfactory military service spanning more than 16 years, so she must have had the capacity to isolate her occupational functioning from her social difficulties in the past. There is some possibility that the longer she is allowed to be dysfunctional on the job, the more ingrained a patient identity will become. Countless other ill veterans have been given psychiatric diagnoses. Unfortunately, in general, only limited disability payments are available for psychiatric problems. Yeah, my symptoms began uh, in the Gulf uh, with um, severe abdominal cramping and, and severe diarrhea that um, was accompanied with severe headaches and, um, and bouts of dizziness and, um, and tingling, uh, you know. Um, and as once I returned back to Germany, uh, the headaches continued and the, uh, you know, I went through periods of night sweats. And I also began to notice uh, uh, my, my joints were stiff. My knees would swell uh, after running. Uh, it was harder for me to, uh, to do things without feeling shortness of breath. I spent eight years in, <clears throat> in the 82nd Airborne Division as a paratrooper. I was in excellent physical condition. And um, I also participated in, uh, in many uh, athletic activities. I represented 7th Corps in the Army Tennis Championships uh, when I was in Europe. And now uh, I have great difficulty uh, walking around the block without just, or walking up a flight or two of stairs without being totally wiped out and in pain. Toxicologist Dr. Gunnar Heuser, MD, PhD, has lectured on chemical injury and chemical sensitivity to professional meetings worldwide. I see patients who uh, have a history of chemical injury. And I have seen patients more recently who were involved in the Gulf War and now developed a Gulf War syndrome. And one statement I can make is that uh, the patients who come to me with Gulf War syndrome have exactly the same complaints as the patients I see from chemical injury. So one statement I can make is that all their symptoms can be explained on the basis of chemical exposure alone. Now I'm very much aware of the fact that there was more than chemical exposure in the Gulf War. Uh, there were infections, there were uh, vaccinations, uh, there was uh, all kinds of warfare, there was radioactivity, and uh, these are all controversial issues but my point is that a Gulf War, a patient with Gulf War syndrome has exactly the same complaints as patients of mine who have never been to the Gulf War but have had chemical exposure. As a paratrooper, I, I had uh, extensive exposure to uh, jet fuel and jet fumes. Uh, and uh, it never, never bothered me. Uh, and uh, after coming back from the Gulf War uh, and having been in the oil fields for that length of time, breathing in the, the noxious uh, fumes on a daily basis, uh, now just the smell of, of diesel fuel uh, makes me severely nauseated, dizzy, and, um, and very sick. Perfumes. I don't wear any type of cologne because it, you know, it makes me nauseous. And, and things just got to the point where, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I had diarrhea on myself at work, you know, a couple of times, and I said, enough's enough, you know, and I, I need to get help, and it was real embarrassing, you know, to be standing around all your men and all of a sudden you can't even make it to the bathroom on time. My, my most recent findings from the Army Physical Evaluation Board are that I have undifferentiated somatoform disorder, um, which is 
the biggest insult that I can even begin to imagine. There are those who believe that MCS is psychogenic, that is, that it's all in the mind. Based upon my experience over the past more than 20 years taking care of patients with MCS at the Massachusetts General Hospital, I have no doubt that MCS is a physical and physiologic disease. It is not a psychogenic disease. There are often visible manifestations of disease in patients who come into my office. These include, for example, flushing of the face, swollen mucous membranes of the nose that are directly associated with exposures, in some cases increased heart rate, in some cases increased blood pressure. When these individuals are not exposed to chemicals, their skin is normal, their blood pressure is normal, and their heart rate is normal. Unfortunately, there is no laboratory test that has an MCS sign on it. You can't take a chest x-ray and diagnose MCS. You can't draw a complete blood count and diagnose MCS. And that's one of the difficulties. Hopefully, with research and improved understanding, one day we will be able to do that, but presently it is not possible. During the Gulf War, coalition forces bombed 28 of Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons factories and storage depots, releasing deadly nerve agents like sarin and mustard gas that drifted south over our soldiers. When the U.S. forces blew up the vast munitions bunkers at Kamasiya after the war, Large quantities of sarin nerve agent were released and drifted over at least 100,000 U.S. troops. In the early days of the war, at least 250,000 U.S. soldiers were required to take pyridostigmine bromide pills, PB pills, three times a day as a protection against possible enemy use of Soman nerve agent. The PB pills were themselves quite toxic because PB is a carbamate pesticide. The possibility that PB pills may have induced chemical sensitivity in soldiers is raised in a report commissioned by the Department of Defense from the RAND Corporation, a major think tank. The first section of Chapter 11 is titled, Does PB Lead to MCS? Another major toxic exposure during the Gulf War occurred when the Iraqis lit over 600 oil well fires as they retreated from Kuwait. Many of the soldiers reported that they were coughing up oil and tar and sweating an oil-like substance for months after they returned from the Gulf as a result of their exposures to these fires. We had 60 oil wells burning where I was. People that had never had asthma before uh, had asthma during Kuwait. We saw no sunlight for almost 45 days. The sun was completely blackened out by this thick film of, of smoke and soot. When you spit, it looked like oil. If you blew your nose, it looked like axle grease. It was 17 days before we had enough water that any of us could take a shower. <clears throat> we took the shower in a tent, of course, closed in. We got clean until we opened the tent door, put on our dirty, oil-soaked clothing because we had, did not have enough water for laundry. With each passing year, more sick veterans are becoming aware that chemicals are triggering their symptoms. Even ALS victims Randy Hebert and Michael Donnelly have chemical sensitivities, as do all the other veterans we interview. I have problems breathing in, in atmospheres where there's heavy perfume concentrates. Gasoline, uh, that makes me sick at my stomach. Terry's extreme sensitivity to chemicals makes him especially vulnerable to perfume inserts in magazines. I hate it. Somewhere in a magazine you'll be reading and they'll have a perfume advertisement. And when you open that page, it releases that perfume. I had it hit me one time. I was just going through the magazine. I opened it up and this was a, apparently a pretty potent perfume that put me immediately into an asthma attack. And 
I had only just been diagnosed with asthma since I had come back from over there. The asthma attack I had increased during the night. I, I used uh, my inhalers, uh, I went to bed anyway, I got, I, then, I, then my breathing got extremely bad. They sent a rescue unit to get me uh, because I was, and in the rescue unit I stopped breathing uh, three times. They took me straight back in the, straight back into the emergency room, continued giving me uh, treatments about the time they thought I'd be all right, I'd quit breathing again. And it took a couple of days to get me back to breathing like I was supposed to, all because of a dad burn little advertisement for, for a perfume cost me a couple of days in the in the hospital. I had a $580 rescue bill. I had over a $2,000 emergency room bill and approximately $3,000 hospital bill. Not getting any assistance from, I don't have no Medicare because I haven't been approved yet. And I'm not getting anything from the the government, I had to pay these bills myself. I have a discharge paper from Washington, D.C. that says I have possible multiple chemical sensitivity. I was going down, I applied for Medicare, and they send you, Social Security people send you to their doctors. Casual conversation with the doctor before he started his examination, I mentioned multiple chemical sensitivity. The doctor went crazy really flew off on me. He says, I'm going to tell you right now, sir, you just lost all your credibility with me. There's no such thing as that. And, uh, and sure enough, I got turned down. I don't know what kind of report he wrote. Regarding the issue of, of chemical sensitivity and, its, and its, its lack of acceptance in the past, we would be so much farther ahead if there had not been this resistance in the minds of the medical and scientific community to looking at the possibility of the reality of this condition. And we would be in a far better position to be able to help these Gulf War veterans, I believe. Now we can also do what is called a PET scan. The PET scan is a scan where you are given, or the patient is given, radioactive sugar, glucose. And the glucose is needed by the brain to function. In other words, every part of the brain functions only because it uses glucose. So if you have radioactivity going to all over the brain as it is activated, then that's normal. But if you find that certain parts of the brain don't get the glucose, that implies that that part of the brain doesn't function well. And I brought some scans to show how a PET scan can look three-dimensionally and where there are what I call holes in, uh, you can see in the three-dimensional, and these holes are not real holes, they are functional holes, meaning where you see these holes, that's where the brain doesn't function properly. And the examples I brought are patients where the MRI was normal, meaning that there is really no hole. They have all the cells, it's just that the cells don't, fu don't function properly. And so with these scans, the SPECT and the PET, we can look at blood flow, which is often decreased. Therefore, oxygen delivery to that part of the brain is decreased. And two, we can show that metabolism of the brain is decreased in certain areas. Disbelief among VA physicians has made it difficult for veterans who have been too ill to work to receive disability payments. On February 28, 2001, Two of these veterans, described at a Washington, D.C. press conference organized by Allison Johnson, the devastating effects this lack of disability payments has had upon their lives. I was paying child support for our two children for a couple of years. I paid it by running up my MasterCard, gold MasterCard, in $6,000 in debt. But by September 1993, I was over my credit limit. They canceled my credit card. I had owed my parents over $3,000 trying to pay the child support. I couldn't get no more money anywhere. 
To top it off, I was just feeling exhausted, couldn't work, and in and out of the hospital. When I was continued to be unable to pay my child support, my ex-wife took me to court again. The judge put me in jail for five days the first time. The, the two months later, my ex-wife took me to court again, and this time they put me in jail for 30 days. I didn't, he didn't even, I didn't even look at the paper I showed him indicating that the state of North Carolina had given me Medicaid because I was unable to work and tried, tried eight different jobs. When they transported me to the hospital when I was in jail, they put me in leg irons, waist chains, and handcuffs. Larry Perry has applied to the VA for disability 14 times and has been denied 14 times. As of February 2003, he has received no money at all from the VA. As time went on, I was missing a lot of time from work. They put me on medication because they thought I might be, might be some form of muscular dystrophy. I was missing so much time from work, I finally had to stop working. My wife and I declared bankruptcy. We lost our house and our car and everything. We had to sell our furniture, my wife's jewelry, to make ends meet. In March 2002, 11 years after he returned from the Gulf War with serious medical problems, Jeffrey Parquet at last obtained disability status from the VA. We know that the people who went to serve our country were exposed to a host of pharmaceuticals, chemicals, and environmental toxins. You might ask the question, well, why do we need to know the cause? Of the 700,000 who served in Desert Storm who are affected in some way, uh, why don't we just treat them? Why do we have to go forward and find the cause? We have to go forward and find the cause so that we won't have another 100,000 next time. And to this day, I could still hear the, the squealing of the iron. I can hear the rumbling of the first tower coming down. So being an iron worker and being a person in the construction field where every day you face some type of hazard or some type of danger, well, right after we witnessed that collapse, we knew that we wanted to uh, to go into the Trade Center site. But I was there somewhere between 29 to 32 days. And my first four days, sometimes we were there around the clock. We weren't getting paid. We were there as volunteers, utilizing our capacity as iron workers to cut up debris, such as the enormous iron beams and columns, all the massive structures that were still there. We remember the signs all across the city. Iron workers, come quickly, come to the site, we need you. The iron workers rushed down to, to help work the iron to find the people. And now many of them are sick. Obviously 9-11 was a tremendous uh, health disaster and uh, in my opinion, the response of government at all levels, federal, state, and local government, was not only uh, inadequate, it was dishonest and wrong, and is largely responsible for many, many people getting sick and many people who will get sick that we, who we haven't seen yet. We were one of the first units into the South Tower. Last thing I remember seeing, actually, was a helicopter trying to go to um, one of the towers to get people off the tower, hearing you know someone say it was going to blow, and a humongous fireball. It looked like a meteor coming at us. Bonnie had never had asthma before 9/11, but by the time the day was over, she had had three bad asthma attacks. People just don't understand not being able to catch your breath, not being able to fill your lungs. It's such a horrible, horrible feeling. It feels like someone's crushing your chest and basically sucking everything out of you. 
I was one of the uh, people who started the agency over 35 years ago, and I started our program for toxic waste, solid waste, and emergency response. For the last 35 years, on and off, I've been the chief investigator on hazardous sites for EPA. When I was the chief investigator for EPA's Ombudsman Office, I investigated the environmental and public health issues related to the World Trade Center attack. We held two public hearings that lasted almost 12 hours each, in February and then in March of 2002, as part of our investigation. Uh, we had uh, testimony from the public, we had testimony from leading scientists from all over the country, uh, and we found that uh, the area was a public health and an environmental catastrophe. Since 9-11, the smell of gasoline and diesel fuel is such that I don't get out and even fuel my own vehicles. I don't even want it on my hands because of the odor. Being around the job sites and being around the smell of the diesel and the gasoline, I am so symptomatic to that involvement that I was constantly getting problems with my throat. I would wind up going hoarse and I would lose my voice sometimes. The next thing you know, from a sore throat, I'd have a chest infection. I get lung infections, then I get pneumonia. And this never, ever happened to me before in my life. Now the smell of smoke actually sickens me, sometimes giving me headaches. I know I can't use any type of uh, cologne or aftershave. I, I can't take that smell. It's sort of like a burning inside my nostrils. I'm very acute. I can't be in restaurants because, God forbid, someone has perfume on. I can go into a fit. I can feel nauseous and throw up. My throat can close up. The multiple chemical sensitivity issues that have come from 9-11 have not been addressed. Household cleaners. Oh my God, you just might as well pack me up at that point and just send me to the hospital. I've been tracking the firefighters um, post 9-11 and what many, many have told me and their medical reports have shown that they become hypersensitive to other chemicals that are out there. They could be fine for a while, they have you know, respiratory problems, they run three quarter time, meaning that they're not, they're not on active duty, and boom, they'll come across perfume or, or other chemicals out there, even household cleaning chemicals, and they'll just become immobilized. Some of them, some of them just become so sick that they can't, they basically can't function on, on a daily level. One of the things uh, that uh, we uncovered at EPA doing investigations of releases of hazardous material is large numbers of people where there are releases start to develop uh, what we call uh, chemical sensitivity. And so we're seeing health effects to the public around hazardous sites like the World Trade Center. Uh, a year, two years, three years down the line where people are now sensitive to chemicals. A little bit of perfume, for example, which would not affect anybody, can make people deathly ill. Another striking thing is that many of our patients are much more reactive to strong odors than they were before. Not always with exactly the same kind of reaction that they'll experience when they're exposed to cigarette smoke or bus exhaust, but they notice these odors more and find themselves reacting physically unpleasantly to these odors in ways they never did before. I have patients who cannot walk into a department store cosmetic area without experiencing shortness of breath and chest tightness in ways they never did before. I have patients who cannot get on an elevator where someone is wearing strong perfume or cologne without experiencing fairly intense respiratory reactions. We don't always understand why this is so, 
but is it ex extremely commonly reported among our World Trade Center responders. And many of our patients say that they're simply unable to wear fragrances themselves or be around others, family members, friends who wear such fragrances because they simply can't tolerate them. It's torture. You know, some days um, you wish you died that day because living, I, I don't call this living, part of me died 9-11. I will never get that back. And I've been existing day in, day out. Uh, I felt like, my gosh, we failed to protect these workers to start with, but having failed to protect them, and spending money to monitor, to spend no money to heal them and make them better, extend their life, um, have them treated as if it's their fault. So nothing very good that I can say about how we've handled this issue. We become different people. A lot of us, we explain it sometimes as if you were dead, it would have been a final saving grace in some respects. But being left alive and symptomatic from what you experienced leaves you a hollow shell of a, an individual now. And you feel that way because it's not the same you. The onset of MCS is often in association with a relatively high level chemical exposure. It can occur, however, with lower level chemical exposures. I've seen a number of patients whose disease began during the course of their work in a building or an office with inadequate ven ventilation, with poor indoor air quality. Before she developed MCS at age 32, Jen Duncan had a lot going for her in life. She had excellent and creative jobs. She enjoyed dance and yoga and African drums. I have spoken with many chemically sensitive people during the last three decades. But Jen is definitely the worst case of MCS that I have encountered. She stands as an extreme example of the neurological effects that chemical exposure can induce in certain individuals. I had developed chemical sensitivity prior to 9-11. Um, the office building where I worked was doing renovations and after prolonged exposure over several weeks in a poorly ventilated area to a number of those chemicals, uh, I had a number of strange symptoms and uh, unusual things that were going on that then later on um, we realized was developed into multiple chemical sensitivity and other chemical injury symptoms. After 9-11 with all the exposure of the smoke and the fumes blowing over from Manhattan into Brooklyn, I definitely experienced exacerbation and got even more debilitated. And, you know, being exposed just to um, cologne or um, if I was out around traffic or somebody smoking a cigarette, that it would make me uh, disintegrate and have the disorientation and the trouble breathing and the great pain, joint pain. Spelling is hard. So Numbers are hard. I get, I have dyslexia sometimes now. Like, I, I, I always check and double check. I, I, I would write an envelope and it would be returned because I mix up numbers. I never had a problem with numbers before, you know, I did calculus and differential <laughs> equations. And if somebody asks me numbers or to spell something, it's really hard. Sometimes it helps me. I know I knew a little sign language before, so I, I usually s s spell out just to help me get something physical to get 
the numbers or letters out. Sorry, I'm getting fatigued, so I'm trying to just ride the waves and <laughs> hold my energy together to get through. Believe it or not, that was Jen on one of her good days. We had also filmed her the day after a doctor's appointment. Jen told us that exposure to several air fresheners and diesel fumes in the private medical transport that had taken her to this appointment had caused this temporary but sharp decline in her condition. In June of 2009, the CDC put on its internal website an indoor air environmental quality policy intended to maintain good indoor air quality in buildings in which its employees worked. So among other things, the CDC policy states scented or fragranced products are prohibited at all times in all interior space owned, rented, or leased by the CDC. And this includes the use of the following products, incense, candles, or reed diffusers, fragrance emitting devices of any kind, wall mounted devices similar to fragrance emitting devices that operate automatically or by pushing a button to dispense deodorizers or disinfectants, potpourri, plug-in or spray air fresheners, urinal or toilet blocks, other fragrance deodorizer, reodorizer products. In addition, the CDC encourages employees to be as fragrance free as possible when they arrive in the workplace. The policy states fragrance is not appropriate for a professional work environment and the use of some products with fragrance may be detrimental to the health of workers with the following diseases, chemical sensitivities, allergies, asthma, and chronic headaches and migraines. It is important to note that the EPA website lists air fresheners as a source of indoor air pollution. Professor Ann Steinemann, a civil engineer who has taught at both Georgia Tech and the University of Washington, has analyzed the secret ingredients in several leading fragrance products like air fresheners and laundry products. Dr. Steinemann found significant numbers of toxic chemicals in these products. Dr. Steinemann's website contains extensive information about her studies. The CDC indoor air quality policy is a very important policy and provides an example of what we should be doing in every workplace in this country. I think all workplaces should be fragrance free. The number of people who are chemically sensitive and or with diagnosed MCS is increasing on a daily basis. In the last couple of decades, I have seen a rapid acceleration in the number of people reporting that they have developed chemical sensitivity. In 2009, Professors Stanley Caress and Ann Steinemann published in the Journal of Environmental Health the results of their national prevalence study on chemical sensitivity. In this national prevalence study, 3.2% of the respondents said that they had been medically diagnosed with MCS. This result suggests that over 10 million Americans are suffering from multiple chemical sensitivity. That's a number greater than the population of the state of Michigan. Journalists often refer to MCS as a rare condition. That's hardly the case. A fragrance-free policy allows those individuals who are chemically sensitive to continue their employment. As a result, they do not have to turn to Social Security disability for income. Those who are not the beneficiaries of a fragrance-free policy are often unable to work and do find themselves on social security disability. We want to keep these people in the workforce. We don't want these people on public assistance. And it's vitally important that we make our workplaces free of chemical pollutants. Patients with MCS and physicians who may be treating them need to remember that if it's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. There are no miraculous cures out there, at least none that I know about. Patients with MCS travel great distances, sometimes to receive what is touted as a miracle cure. They spend lots of money to receive this so-called miracle cure, and in the end, it is not a miracle cure. 
it often makes symptoms worse rather than better and at the end of the day it does not cure the disease. Until we better understand the pathophysiologic mechanisms we're not going to be able to do much better than avoidance of exposures in my opinion and to better understand the pathophysiologic mechanisms we need funded research in this area. Funding for research in chemical sensitivity in this country uh, does not measure up to the size of the health problem, the public health problem that it is. Uh, Japan does a much better job than we do in studying this problem and making funds available for serious researchers. I believe the reason that we haven't seen more research funding is political rather than scientific. There are commercial interests, uh, the manufacturers of consumer products that pollute the air that we breathe and the workers' comp insurance companies and others that perceive that if we knew more about this problem they would be liable for people suffering and frankly they don't want it studied. Visitors to the website of the Chemical Sensitivity Foundation, which I chair, can view a bibliography of over 120 research articles on chemical sensitivity that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. The 13-page CDC policy on indoor environmental quality can also be viewed on that website. I urge those of you who may be skeptical about the reality of multiple chemical sensitivity to look at these sources. Disbelief among many physicians has had the consequence of causing many desperate MCS patients to seek help from alternative medicine providers who run the gamut from reputable practitioners to those offering dubious miracle cures. Chapter 3 of my book, Amputated Lives, Coping with Chemical Sensitivity, is titled the consequences of disbelief. In this chapter, I note that suicide is too frequently the outcome for chemically sensitive patients who cannot find a place to work or to live that does not make them sick and who all too often face a discouraging disbelief from the medical community or their family and friends. Those who cling to an unwarranted skepticism about chemical sensitivity without even attempting to educate themselves about this complex condition may unfortunately be, in effect, assisting in suicide. In closing, I have a special request for those of you who are fortunate enough not to have developed multiple chemical sensitivity. Your efforts to treat those with MCS with kindness and compassion instead of skepticism and sometimes even hostility will do much to make their difficult lives more tolerable.